Welcome to the Room Now podcast. It's the 15th of November, 2019, and I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. This podcast is going to be devoted to a recreation of my half of Rheumatology Roundup. Every year at the ACR meeting on the last day, Dr. Artie Cavanaugh and I go over our favorite abstracts and presentations from the annual meeting, and this is my half of the presentation. You'll have to talk to Artie and get his, his half. Um, he's working on his podcast. No, not really. My favorites included Abstract 1223. This was an abstract from Grujic et al. A nice uh, novel uh, presentation about a new way to treat gout. Specifically, it's about a, a urate degrading enteric enzyme that is uh, called ALLN-346. Uh, the idea here, of course, is that your acid levels in anyone depends on how much you make and how much you get rid of. Most of the uric acid excretion in all of us, about two-thirds of it, is through the kidney, but about one-third of it is through the intestinal tract. So these researchers have developed a non-absorbable, uh, orally administered, uh, recombinant uric acid uh, degrading enzyme, or urate degrading enzyme, I should say, that... Um, can be given uh, orally and in the intestine would help to excrete um, uh, your uric acid levels so that they're not reabsorbed. Uh, this uh, was tested in a pig model wherein seven pigs were given um, an infusion of uric acid to develop hyperuricemia and then were given this orally administered ALN346 and they showed a rapid reduction in serum uric acid levels, plasma uric acid levels specifically, uh, where they went down from like over seven and a half or seven seven or something like that to down to 4.5 or less. Uh, this was really quite um, interesting in that it was easily done, uh, easily administered, highly effective, and uh, didn't seem to have much in the way of toxicity because it's not absorbed. So this might be a novel new way in the future of managing patients with gout um, a way that we are, is currently not being used. Another novel presentation comes from our friend in Italy, Fabrizio Di Benedetti, who's a leader in the pediatric rheumatology community, does a lot of major trials uh, that have impacted rheumatology and pediatric rheumatology. Yet again, he's involved in, I think, a major trial with a gamma interferon neutralizing antibody called um, uh, emipalumab. Emipalumab is a, a, a new drug that's actually been approved for the use, uh, for its use in uh, HLH. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in those patients, many of them being genetic, driven by perforin and whatnot, a, uh, you know, this, this is, the outcomes are disastrous. And it's all driven by gamma interferon. So we do know that the um, HLH and MAS, macrophage activation syndrome, are very much the same and how they uh, start, how they, what their course is like, and the risk of morbidity, if not mortality. In, and amongst uh, uh, most cases of MAS, JIA, systemic JIA, and adult stills is the leading cause of MAS by far. Uh, and most of those patients are difficult to treat. You, you know, they're crashing, they have you know, lab enzyme levels in the thousands, um, they look toxic, they're uh, hemodynamically unstable, they develop liver failure, their ferritins are 20,000. Anyway, they're really sick. What do you do? You give them high-dose steroids, you start an IL-1 or an IL-6 inhibitor if they're not already on them. And oh, okay, by the way, being on IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitors doesn't protect you from getting MAS. Um, and then you have to give them something to shut off the cytokine storm. Um, driven all by a uh, tremendous release of gamma interferon. So we use in rheumatology and other disciplines uh, cyclosporin. Others will use etoposide if you're consulting a hematologist. Well, this is another new way, and this drug is approved uh, and available, but not for MAS, but instead for HLH. You could probably get it for your patients who are very sick. But nonetheless, it's given as a um, twice-a-week infusion. Um, it neutralizes gamma interferon. We know that because when you look at um, uh, CXCL9, which is a product of gamma interferon production, those levels were gigantic and go way down right quick when you give this therapy. Uh, in this particular abstract, they studied nine patients, uh, all showing dramatic improvement, all able to drop their high-dose steroid therapy down to less than 0.8 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, it was very well tolerated in this study 
But in HLH patients who are very, very sick, the toxicity uh, numbers don't look good. A lot of serious adverse events, a lot of uh, infections, a lot of reactions. So it remains to be seen how safe this is going to be, especially in very sick patients uh, where it's hard to discern drug effect from the disease effect. But nonetheless, this is, could be life-threatening therapy. It's called Gammafant. This abstract was L06, late-breaking abstract L06. So a nice presentation was done by Dan um, Solomon on methotrexate and its uh, safety uh, as drawn from the SEARCH study. The SEARCH study was the cardiovascular study, not a rheumatoid study, patients with cardiovascular disease going on methotrexate who were then followed to see if it would help their cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, 5,000 or more patients were enrolled or close to 5,000 were enrolled and the study was stopped for futility. It did not help their cardiovascular outcomes. That's another podcast, another report. Go back and find it. But in this particular po podcast, again, they had 4786 patients who were given either placebo or methotrexate. So that's like 2,300 plus patients on methotrexate followed for over a year. And what were the side effects? Uh, this is of interest to rheumatologists because these happen in non-rheumatology patients. Overall, there was a 17% increase in side effects, most of them being mild. Um, gastrointestinal events were double the rate, pulmonary events were 50% higher. What you should know about is methotrexate pneumonitis, a very rare event if you're treating your patients with concomitant folic acid. Um, in this study, everybody was on folic acid, the rate in the placebo population was 2 per 1,000. The rate in the methotrexate population was 7 per 100. Um, so it is up, but it's not significant. That's the number that you should know about, 7 per 100 or 0.3% in patients who are uh, on folic acid. Infectious events were somewhat increased, mostly these being mild infections. Um, hematologic events, again, mild increased. Skin cancers, twofold increase, and that included basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma cancers. Pancytopenia was rare. It was uh, 3 in 1,000 in the placebo population and 13 in 100 in the methotrexate population. So this is the reason why we do frequent laboratory monitoring. There were six cases of cirrhosis. Um, there was really not predictable other than LFTs. And no, it wasn't gigantic LFTs. It was the low-grade LFTs that was seen. Hence the ACR guidelines that you need to follow, five out of nine uh, laboratory tests showing LFTs in any range of abnormality is reason enough for stop, worry, dose reduce, discontinue, biopsy if you must. Uh, a very helpful report, uh, abstracts number, um, uh, what was that, 1890, and the safety abstract on cirrhosis was 2357. The ANIGO study is a quick study that was done by Ken Seg. It's a double-blind placebo control trial, sorry, active control trial, where 165 patients are either given placebo, and these patients have acute gout. And this is serious, real disease, acute gout, high uric acids, four to five attacks in the last year. 165 patients are randomized to receive uh, one-third get placebo, oh, I'm sorry, one-third get uh, triamcinolone, a 40 milligram IM injection and then two-thirds get either 100 or 200 of anakinra. And the outcome here is, it's a five-day trial, the outcome here is pain at day three. And the responses to both were very good, suggesting that, and this was powered to be a, superior, a superiority study, but it was not superior, it was equal, saying that you could use IM steroids or in certain situations where you couldn't use steroids or colchicine or other therapies to manage acute gout, uh, uh, anakinra will work. Um, it's just probably not going to get an FDA indication for this. Pregnancy and when to stop the biologic. Abstracts 2292 and 2279, one from uh, Italy and Spain, the other one from Germany, all said the same thing. Your rheumatoid arthritis patient is contemplating pregnancy. They're on therapy. They're on taking a biologic, most of whom are taking TNF inhibitors. They get pregnant, what do you do? Or leading up to the pregnancy, what do you tell them? Well, you tell them, continue the biologic until you get pregnant, and then let's see. Well, it turns out if you stop the biologic at the first sign of pregnancy with a positive um, HCG pregnancy test, it uh, turns out that those patients who stop at the positive test, uh, because they are now uh, declared to be positive, one, uh, there's a threefold higher rate of flares in patients who stop and don't continue. The point being, there's probably not a good reason to stop. And this 
uh, was largely done in TNF inhibitor uh, received patients, but also in the Germany population, they had some patients on tocilizumab and rituximab. Rituximab, you can't stop right away, right? So, but the bottom line is in Germany, they had 63% flare rate in, during the pregnancy in the population that stopped, and those that continued, the flare rate was about 20%. So again, a threefold higher rate of flares if you stop the biologic when they come pregnant. If it's the first pregnancy, the mom's gonna wanna stop. But the pro I think since a third of patients or more will flare during pregnancy, maybe the deal is you should continue and show that they're gonna be stable during pregnancy and then stop if you need to and restart if you need to. I think this was really important and helpful research. Speaking of delays, there's the problem of delay in diagnosis in patients with inflammatory back pain getting to a rheumatologist, getting diagnosed with spondylitis appropriately. There were three abstract, two abstracts on this. One um, from Argentina, Scarafia and colleagues, abstract 633, looked at their experience of uh, 200 patients who had low back pain, uh, who were referred, not referred, and how they were treated by rheumatologists. What I thought was important in this abstract was that the 2010, the length of time it took for a, a back pain patient to get from symptom or, or primary care to the rheumatologist was, was four years or 48 months. By 2019, this had dropped to 12 months, suggesting that put you know that your education is doing a, a lot of good. Uh, teaching the primary care population how to send you patients who you want to send is very important. Actually, abstract number 633 from the Cleveland Clinic. Magri and colleagues actually did a survey of almost 1,700 health care providers, mostly primary care doctors, and their experience with inflammatory low back pain. First, they said in their opinion that um, two-thirds of their patients were, uh, had seen their primary care doctor, them, the HCP, first for the management of their back pain. So there, it turns to, as we would expect, primary care is where patients go to get an answer even when it comes to back pain or inflammatory back pain. Uh, of course, many of them said they referred, and the problems with referrals were many. 90% said that it took more than two months to get a patient referred to a specialist. Moreover, there were a lot of problems beyond long wait times with insurance. And more than half the patients had problems with insurance and getting referrals. A third said there was no specialist in their area. And 25% said that the patients were reluctant to go see a specialist. So we can see we have a lot of hurdles here and a lot of education that needs to be done on how to best manage and refer patients with inflammatory back pain. Abstract number 196 looked at patients from the National Data Bank. This is uh, started by Fred Wolf, now being run by Caleb Michaud. Uh, 25 plus thousand rheumatoid patients uh, were looked at and they found um, amongst that 25,000, there was 500 who had their first unprovoked venous thromboembolic event, either DVT or PE and they wanted to see what happened with them. What they showed was that of that 506 patients, um, they tended to have worse rheumatoid arthritis, they tended to have more cardiovascular risk factors than did patients who otherwise did not have a heart or, or a venous event. But more importantly, the VTE patients um, um, were at a twofold higher risk of developing atherosclerotic coronary artery cardiovascular events suggesting that it's not just the venous and the arterial are not truly separated here, that the risk factors being one, inflammation, and these activity, uh, apply to both. So identifying patients with a VTE also means you're identifying someone who's at significant risk for um, a heart attack and stroke and other cardiovascular endpoints that you don't want to see. Uh, hence, these people need to be monitored, um, counseled, seen by their primary care, if not cardiologist. Two more. 2566, this comes from the University of Manitoba. Um, uh, Seguin and colleagues looked at the issue of polypharmacy in their lupus patients. They had 392 lupus patients that they've been following and they found that polypharmacy, defined as either more, five or more drugs or 10 or more drugs, is quite common, especially in the age groups over age 40 and um, up to age 65. Uh, and what they saw was with increasing age that uh, there are a lot of things that went along with polypharmacy, being female, uh, being older, rural residents, uh, high, um, you know, uh, other comorbidities, the high Charleston comorbidity index. Um, but m interestingly, they saw a rise in the use of benzodiazepines. So your lupus patients who are victims of polypharmacy are at greater risk of benzodiazepine use 
And that's something to be worried about and be concerned about. We have reported recently here about uh, opioid abuse in lupus patients, especially lupus patients go to the ER. This is yet another thing to worry about in your patients with chronic lupus who are under your care. The last one I'll talk about is the Embrace study, abstract 860. This was a study, more or less a commitment by the manufacturer to the FDA that when belimumab was approved, there was some cloud around its utility and safety or efficacy in African Americans, because there were very few in the original phase two and phase three trials. So it was a commitment to do another study. They did. This study is a 499 patient study, 488 patient study, who received belimumab um, uh, and standard of care. Um, and they really wanted to see what would happen here. So they stayed on their background standard of care. They did not have severe uh, renal disease or brain disease going in. Uh, and the primary endpoint in this study was improvement according to the uh, SRI 2K response, a sort of standard that's, um, that's been used in other trials. Well, for primary endpoint, um, all these patients being black, uh, they did not meet the primary endpoint uh, as far as getting better um, on, on the drug. So again, the hazard ratio was higher. I mean, the odds ratio was higher, but it was not significant. However, when they looked at blacks who had d uh, disease activity measures, meaning they had either a high sleet eye um, 2K score greater than 10, or they had uh, um, elevated, uh, excuse me, low C3 and C4, or low C3 and C4 with an elevated double-stranded double DNA, those were all um, significantly better on belimumab. Uh, those with just an elevated double strand DNA were not better. So the, they met the objective of the study to study this in African Americans. They met, they did not meet the primary endpoint showing efficacy. They showed a trend, but when they looked at African Americans who had disease activity measures, it looked like belimumab was, was effective. Um, these patients who were treated with belimumab had a 46% lower risk of developing proteinuria or worsening of their proteinuria. We're not really talking about a major renal flare. These are sort of minor renal flares in my opinion. So the drug works. It just maybe is not as stellar as we'd like it to see and it still continues to um, not quite answer the question is who's the best patient to receive belimumab. Again, you have to do a sub-analysis of the primary endpoint or secondary endpoints here to find this point, which is African Americans with high disease activity will do good on belimumab. We have a lot of reports from the ACR, uh, a lot of podcasts that are still following. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. We're going to play them over the next few weeks. Uh, tune in next week to roomnow.com for more ACR 19 content. Thanks.